Hi everyone and welcome to this very special podcast. This edition isn't about well-being as such. I'm doing this podcast with two very, very special people today, Mumtaz and Alia, and it's all about stories to tell for South Asian Heritage Month. I'm going to let Mumtaz and Alia introduce themselves. Um, hi, I'm Mom Taz um, at Computer Centre. Most people know me as Taz. Um, I started at Computer Centre in 2004, so I've just hit my 19th year. So I've been here quite a long time. Um, so when I first started at Computer Centre, it was a very different place from an Asian perspective. There wasn't a lot of visible Muslims. I didn't used to wear the hijab myself at that time. Um, I was religious and I was quite spiritual, but I didn't outwardly, I guess, uh, visibly, it didn't look like I was practicing. Um, and then I think about six years in, I I just had this strong urge to want to put the hijab on. I went to Saudi on a mini pilgrimage and I just decided I'm just doing it. I don't care if I'm not, if there's no, no one else that looks like me, I'm just going to put it on because it was something that I felt quite strongly about and um, I came back from my annual leave and I came in um, I think I came in half an hour earlier just so that I wouldn't have to walk in and everyone stare at me and I sat down and actually quite a few people thought there was a new girl that started (laughs) (laughs) who dad has his desk (laughs) and then um, eventually when everyone realized it was me I didn't really get no one really said anything it was almost kind of like confused looks and then um i told a couple of my friends that i'd worked like work friends beforehand so and i remember i had a friend um who was a pa at the time and i said to her by the way when i come back from my holiday i'm going to be wearing a scarf and she's just like i don't care as long as you bring me back a present <laughs> I love care. priority. <laughs> <laughs> Bring me back a present, you could be wearing a cow on your head, I don't care. So that was quite nice. Um, however, I do remember one person, one elderly lady, um, she's left now, she made quite a negative, um, she made quite a few negative comments. Um, but I just said to myself, she's, she's elderly and, you know, has a different generation, so I just didn't really say anything to her, I just smiled because I, I have heard her saying it. She said it in earshot, but I just thought she's elderly, so you know, we're as South Asians, we're, we are always brought up to always respect our elders. It doesn't matter what culture they're from, if they're elderly, you respect them, you don't, you, you're not rude to them. So I just smiled at her, and then I think about two months into me wearing the hijab. Um, I was I was in the lift with her once, and she said, um, "I don't I don't agree with I don't agree with your um, sudden change. However, you do look pretty with it." <laughs> so I was like, "Okay, thank you." So do you think that was kind of her way of saying, "I'm trying to be nice." Yeah. I don't think what you're doing is right, um, but I'm not being racist. I'm not being rude. Yeah. But you look very pretty. Yeah, I almost felt like she probably thought I didn't, I wasn't mean to her. I didn't, I didn't change the way I conducted myself with her because I did have to work alongside her for various things. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't start being mean. I didn't start, stop saying hello to her or good morning to her. So I think she suddenly probably just realised maybe she wasn't in the right yeah. or, you know, she shouldn't have done that. So your relationship with her didn't change in any way from your perspective. Yeah. Your relationship, your relationship didn't change with any of your colleagues. None of them. Because no. yeah, and that's that's amazing, right? Because yeah. I think for people who maybe don't understand the reasoning behind wearing the hijab, the reasoning behind why someone would go from not wearing it to suddenly deciding wearing it. And by the way, when we say suddenly, it's not actually suddenly, is it? No, it's not. It's something that happens over time where your faith gets stronger and you think this is my final, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you kind of go, this is my final sort of thing to say, I am devout this is what I believe in and I feel like this has almost completed me. Yeah, for me it was almost like, it's a strange one because I I always kind of wanted to but I was kind of scared. Mm. I think I was kind of scared because 
I didn't, I wasn't educated, I didn't feel like I had education myself enough into the reasons why we wear it. So when I, when I felt like, okay, I need to do this and I need to do this for myself. And it was almost like, and, it, and when people came and asked, I knew what people would ask me questions because at that time at CC, there weren't a lot of Asians, um, especially female Asians being in IT industry, especially in sales where I was working at the time. And, um, but again, after a couple of weeks of people just getting comfortable with me wearing it and just thinking, okay, you know what, she's not taking it off. Everyone was just like, oh, it's the same Taz. You're, you're still the same Taz. And I'm like, why wouldn't I be? <laughs> why wouldn't I be? Because I've always had quite a sarcastic, like, nature That hasn't about, changed. That hasn't <laughs> changed a bit. So no, it was, it was quite, it was a bit profound for me because it was almost like, I got stopped by people in the lift as well. I was always in the lift. Um, by somebody else that just said, oh, I'm, I hope you don't mind me asking, have you got married recently? Because I think there's... That's an there, interesting one. There's always this um, <laughs> maybe stereotype, like yeah. if you get married, you put it on. And it comes to like people not being exposed to Muslims, maybe, because, you know, in certain areas. And I was just like, no. And then I said, you know, I just felt it was the right time for me to do it. So I've always... I've always liked people approaching me and asking me, you know, why do you guys fast? Why do you guys cover? You know, all those things. Like, because I feel like I can educate people with absolutely the media yeah. educate people thinking that we're all oppressed or, you know. So that's why. So that's really interesting. Where you said, you know, someone asked you, "Oh, did you get married?" Yeah. <laughs> Um, that's a really interesting one because there is that misconception isn't there that women only do something in certain cultures because a man has told them to and <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's really interesting but maybe the, could you give us a little bit of background as to why you wear the hijab and so, why it's you know part of the pillars of Islam so we wear it as a, as a mark of modesty so, and, and if, if anything, it's actually more empowering. So one of the, like, there was not just the fact that I went away to Saudi Arabia for a mini pilgrimage, there was quite a few things, little things that happened to me previously. And I'm not saying that this is like, you know, everyone should wear it because of that reason, but I, I was followed once. Um, I was on the way, I was walking to an appointment somewhere and I was followed by this man and it scared me because he followed me and then he then overtook me at one point and I went there was like this alleyway and then as I went round the corner to the alleyway he was waiting for me and I, I was really scared I was really really scared and at the time I wasn't wearing hijab and I just thought to myself obviously it's one of those things that I just and I just thought to myself I need to do what I can control I mean I wasn't exposed or you know but even if I was so what and um, another time I was driving somewhere and there was a, a van full of men and they were like saying certain, they were shouting things to me. And I think for me, from a religious aspect, I just thought, well, it's, a, it's really nice when somebody, you know, really fit looks at you and says something. <laughs> Compliments you. But yeah. when, but you can't always control who mm, does that. Absolutely. So yeah. I just felt, let me just do what I can do that I would feel safe in, within myself and that's 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 one of the reasons obviously there's the religious aspect of it where we're told to modesty and you know let other things speak for you you know it's not just about your outer appearance and um, in Islam we believe that the woman's hair is her beauty and it's not just about covering the hair it's about being modest in dress as well so it's just about not getting that kind of attention because you know, it's great if you want that attention, but obviously you can't control who gets yeah. that attention. So, um, Holly, do you have any other things to say about the hijab? Well, I think when we kind of first, well, personally, I started wearing it at a very young age, and that was a personal choice just because I felt comfortable wearing it. I, um, I went to an Islamic primary school and the uniform was hijab um, just to kind of get kids used to it and comfortable with it, especially in a Western society. Um, I did move abroad when I was really young to Egypt and um, I think there I became very comfortable with because it was it's an it's a Muslim country and a lot of people wear it outside 
Um, but it was the norm there, whereas exactly. here it's, it's not, not so much yeah. the norm. Yeah, and absolutely. same thing when I moved to Saudi Arabia when I was about 10 years old. It was the norm, and so I felt extremely comfortable. However, moving back um, to the UK at the age of 16, it was a very big culture shock because even though um, the hijab at that point had been, up to that point, had been like my comfort, my protection, coming back, I felt like the idea of hijab had developed so probably when i was younger it was like you know something that wasn't so well known in like western society however i was 16 i've come back to the uk and now everyone kind of i don't want to say <laughs> it had been kind of fetishized in a way mm. and that made me extremely uncomfortable because previously well maybe because i was younger as well i wasn't the hijab didn't draw attention to me however coming back from like a muslim country where it was so normal and everyone kind of you know you see it and you don't even bat an eyelid coming back to a society where it was like oh she's wearing a hijab but it's not a bad thing it's kind of something that draws more attention to me i was i was really shocked and i had kind of um, did you feel like it wearing the hijab coming back to the uk almost deflected from why you wear the hijab exactly i felt like my reasoning for wearing yeah. the hijab was I didn't want the attention or I wanted to feel more secure in myself and kind of not have everyone looking at me and um, it was the exact opposite yeah. like I was walking down the street and the hijab was the first thing people would see and so then they were looking at me and I felt uh, I kind of went through this thing where I was like why am I wearing it then if it's the purpose for why I put it on why I continue to wear it from a young age was to maintain my modesty and it's draw now drawing more attention to myself why am I still wearing it oh would it be better if I take it off and then you know have like blend into society or just like I had to refocus my morals and re rethink as to why I would want to keep it on and it was yeah it was a very very big di dilemma I faced and yeah and how did that have an impact on your relationship with your family and I think give us both of you Mumtaz and Alia give us some sort of background on because your Mumtaz you are Alia's aunt I am her aunt yeah. and you've previously lived in an extended family which is absolutely amazing and something we will definitely be talking about um, a little bit later on in the podcast but when you say you, you were going through that sort of why am I you know, doubting yourself almost and doubting your reasons for wearing the hijab. How did that impact on your relationship with, you know, Mumtaz or the rest of your extended family? Well, so um, at the time I had moved back from Saudi Arabia, but my parents were still living in Saudi Arabia. And so I was living with my auntie Mumtaz and my sister as well. Um, she moved back with me. And so I feel like uh, between me and my sister we both had this discussion and we were both feeling the same way because we were around the same age she's a year younger than me and we obviously we were both in Egypt we were both in Saudi Arabia together and so we, we'd experienced all the different changes together however um, with my auntie she, obviously she's, un she's understanding because she she made that choice to put it on um, obviously six years into CC like she said but for my parents, it was a hard thing to explain because they weren't with me. They weren't in the UK. They were still in Saudi Arabia. They still had that comfort of knowing like th that security of like, oh, it's normal. It, everyone wears it. It's they, they weren't experiencing what me and my sister were experiencing at the time. That must have been really hard. It was very hard. And just because from the ages of seven to about 16 I had had that comfort and all of a sudden it was gone and I didn't have I didn't have a way to explain what I was feeling it yeah it was very difficult and I think at that time there was a few heated discussions between me my sister and my mum where we were like we were trying to kind of fit in with the society we were currently living in and she was finding it very difficult to kind of understand and rationalise that because she wasn't there. So, yeah. It was and I think the other thing is for even your mum, and that myself, we didn't, we didn't, in our teens, we didn't wear it. Yeah. So I wore it in my, 
like late twenties, and my sister-in-law she wore it when she got married to my brother. <clears throat> so prior to that, we grew up as teenagers not wearing it, so we didn't have to face what Alia and her sister had to face as teenagers. And obviously, with Alia she's just come back, she's a teenager, um, and she wasn't faced. We we couldn't relate to that because. Like I said, we didn't do it. We had like the normal kind of teenage years with, you know, messing around with our hair, colouring it, perming it, not that I have, but, you know, <laughs> do all those things that yeah. you do. And I guess they probably felt like, okay, maybe that's our, we're, we're missing out. But then um, I think they just decided, well, actually, from the religious aspect, because they are educated into it. And it's mm -hmm. not, it's, the thing is, it's not actually forced upon us. Hence the reason why I did it in my late twenties. It's not forced, like especially within my family, and I come from a Bangladeshi background. Um, my parents um, came over in the. My dad came over here a very long time ago. My mum came over in the late sixties. So it's never been something that they've like forced us to do. They've always taught us our religion. Um, my parents lived in St Albans like the whole time that they've been here so they chose to live in a very middle class um, at, at that time a very middle class white area mm -hmm. and they they chose to bring us up in a very like you know in a different way to maybe some of our re extended relatives because they they wanted us to mix with everyone they didn't want us to just be secular within the Bengali community so <clears throat> me and my brothers don't just have we've only got a handful of Bengali friends we've got like a very our, our like social pot is very mixed and it's always been like that our parents have always kind of pushed us to do that as long as you keep your values and your religious values they were like you know this world is very mixed you mix with everyone because my mum's worked and she's always mixed with other people she's like the way you allow people to understand you is by mixing with them and I think there's a massive misconception here, isn't there, that, you know, people from South Asian communities will only stick to their own because of religious reasons yeah, or, yeah. you know, their beliefs. But actually, that's not true, is it? No, not at all. I just remember growing up, um, my mum used to just always be like, you know, back in the day, she used to always be like, come to the school gates and she would talk to like all, I mean, her, her English wasn't the best English, but it's very good compared to like you know other people of her generation. And she'd just talk to all the mums and stuff, and she'd invite them round. And I remember she became really good friends with my brother's friend's mum, who was this English lady who taught my mum how to make jam. <laughs> so to this day, she still makes jam. I love jam. that. <laughs> so you know, mum taught her how to make like I don't know some Indian dish, and you know they they would swap recipes and they would teach each other how to make certain dishes. Because my mum loves jam, so she'll make jam out of everything now, even to this day. Food always connects people. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Food will. It, food is the language of love, mm -hmm. honestly. Because I'm such a foodie, I Safe. can say that. <laughs> I absolutely yeah. love food. Love cooking new foods as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, um, Alia, you talked about um, going to Saudi Arabia and Egypt when you were yeah. younger, and coming back as a teenager to this whole new sort of way of living. Um, and we've talked about extended families as well. So you moved in with Mumtaz and your younger sister. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit, a bit about what extended families are and how, what yours looks like or looked like um, and why it's so important within the South Asian or Bangladeshi community? So with the, the backstory to my family is that um, there's... I've got five, there's five of us siblings. I'm the youngest daughter, I'm the only daughter and I'm the youngest and I've got four older brothers. So when, um, and again, very differently, when my, my brother, Ali's parents, they actually had an arranged marriage, but not arranged like what everyone thinks like. Um, they were introduced to each other and then it was like, okay, if you guys like each other, then, you know, we'll take, uh, we'll take it forward if not then you know nice to meet you type of thing so they were introduced by family members like some an extended family knew somebody that um knew somebody uh, that knew Ali's mum actually it was from a clothing shop that her mum used to shop in they they kind of knew and they're like oh we know this girl and 
that the two family numbers got exchanged and then we went to see her and then it was kind of left to the couple to get to know each other and then they decided that they were going to marry. So it was actually my youngest brother out of the four brothers who was actually getting married first. Normally, the, the normal stance was the eldest gets married and then it kind of, the, the chain effect, but he was the youngest. The others, they were like, no, we don't want to get married. Yeah. So, and then at that time, obviously he was, he was 26, 27. 25. So, or was he 25? He was 25. <laughs> Yeah. My so, mum and dad have a five year age gap, so I know the so age you know exactly. Gap. So yeah, and it was almost like, well, at that time he didn't he didn't have his own house or anything like that. So it was like, okay, they're gonna get married and they're gonna move in with us. So that's how like we the family started extending and then Alia came along and then another brother moved out because of his space wise. But it's the connection is really important to us. Um because like I mentioned earlier, like we put a huge emphasis on respecting elders, um, you know, even outside of the cultural norm, even Islamically, it's like um, we believe in heaven, heaven is beneath your mother's feet, which, you know, because the mother carries you for nine months and, you know, what she has to endure in carrying you, then it's like we're not even allowed to raise our voice to our mothers because of the, those reasons. So that's kind of ingrained in us from a really early age. And just generally, um, we've always had this thing of like, we eat together, we we, we do everything together. Everything. <laughs> everything. Sometimes it's just like, <laughs> not them <laughs> again. <laughs> Literally. So then when Alia came along, it was just like the first baby in the house. And then they were living they were living with us so it was almost like a helping hand for my sister-in-law so she could have a life like she was up all night with the baby i'd just go in like as soon as i'd wake up i'd come and take alia into my room and or she she'd like go to my mom and dad well the there was always that help like obviously my when my sister-in-law first had the baby it was she needed rest mm. so during that time we'd take care of the baby we'd take you know we'd go and give her her baths and say baby but she's right here <laughs> 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 and then um just generally as the families expanded obviously not everyone could live in the same house so with Alia and her siblings um they kind of lived on and off with us because they did move to Egypt so when they'd come back, they'd come back for like summer breaks for two months at a time. So they'd come back and live with us. So half of their stuff was already left in the house. And then you've got my other brother and his his children. So everyone's kind of, the cousins are all brought up as siblings. So there's 11 of them wow. in total. But we make up seven, just me and my siblings. Yeah, you've got seven. I have six, so including me, seven. Yeah. yeah. So... That's yeah. a busy household. Very. <laughs> Does it sometimes get to a point where you think, I just I just need my space? Oh, yes. oh 100%. Step oh, away yes. now. It's bound to. <laughs> yeah. So when, when they used to come over from Saudi, and I'll let Alia talk about Saudi a bit in a bit, but when they used to come over for that two months, um, we don't have a mansion. <laughs> By no means do we have a mansion. We've got, it's a four-bedroom house, but it's two big bedrooms, two small bedrooms. So you're sharing, and I'm like, a, um, I don't really want to say my age, but let's say I'm an adult. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm, I'm sharing a room with like teenagers. And it's just like, right, this, this is weird. Like, I'm having to share a room with teenagers. And, you know, they're like leaving their clothes on the floor. And I'm like, make the bed. And, you know, so it sometimes can be a bit overwhelming. Sometimes you're just like, oh, my God. And so you go into another room and there's like kids there. You go to another room and there's kids there. Yeah. And now you work together. Sorry? And now you work yes. together. Yes. <laughs> We're in each other's faces How all the time. How working together at so, CC? Um, I started at CC almost a year ago now. So it's just coming up to a year um, as an apprentice. And I kind of, well, I used to come visit Computer Centre with my auntie because we were so close and because I was living at her house. Um, she would bring me into the office to kind of sit with her during the day. I would meet people. Yeah. I have memories of meeting people who still work here. Like, yeah. <laughs> I came in when I first started and I was like, oh, hi, I remember you. And they're like, oh my gosh, baby Alia. And I'm like, yeah, well, baby Alia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, well, I'm 19 now, but yeah. <laughs> and because yeah. they were so, so much a part of my life. 
Yeah. You know, when you just come in, you just have a chat and you talk to people, you're like, oh, Ali, this, Murray, this, and you're talking about the kids like they're your own. Because I'm, I'm one of those aunties, like, oh, here's loads, look at the pictures, <laughs> look, look, you know. <laughs> They've walked with them, oh, look, she's, her, her, she's just lost her tooth. I'm like the parent. So a lot of my colleagues that I've kind of worked with over the years, they've kind of, they know Alia, like, <laughs> they've known her to be growing up, and it's kind of strange because now she works with a couple of these people. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> when I first came in, I didn't even recognise some of them, and I was talking just as in, I like, introducing myself, oh, hi, I'm an apprentice, I started to, at CC, like, in July, and then I said, oh, yeah, my auntie works here. Who's your auntie, Taz? Oh, my gosh, baby Ollie. And I'm like, oh, hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> it's very... That name yeah. is going to stick with you. Baby Ollie, I know. <laughs> Throughout the whole journey through CC, that's going to stick with you. Yeah, and it's a very weird, weird feeling, like, not remembering someone, but them knowing, like, oh, yes, I, I remember when you first started walking or I remember your first words. And I'm like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Because I think my auntie, she started working at Computer Centre about six months after I was born, so pretty much my whole childhood. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's been speaking about me. So. But I think that's amazing. And one thing that's really interesting about extended families that I think a lot of people need to get educated on is that it's not a religious thing, is it? No. It's not more of a cultural, yeah. because... Mm-hmm. I've spoken to so many different people from the South Asian heritage um, or cultural background and they all come from different religions Um, but the one thing that connects everyone is relationships Yeah. Yeah. and how living in an extended family almost builds that relationship where you've just said it Montaz where you're that proud aunt who's showing the pictures what's the difference between that and Alia's mom who does exactly the same thing yeah. so you yeah. know it's about building really really strong relationships which will go on throughout your whole life um, and it's really interesting because a lot of people do here in England anyway I don't know about in the rest of the world but you know it's a very sort of nuclear family where it's mum and dad or you know um you know same sex parents or whatever however their family unit is but it's usually one or two ch- children yeah. um a lot of people that i talk to don't really have extended family and they find it really unusual when you say to them oh you know like for example if mom Taz is talking yeah there's me and 11 other people in the house yeah <laughs> And I could just see their mind just going. It does. It boggles because when I yeah. when I talk about it in the office, like because now it's just at home. It's just me, my mum and dad. Um, and my brothers have all got their own houses and they they've got their 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 homes. But the heart of the family is still my house because my yeah. parents are there. So I mean, literally everyone comes in and out when they want. And there's no like, can I have juice? Can I have this? Can I have that? The kids are just raiding the cupboards like it's their own home. Um, and, and that's just how it is. And now what we do every Friday evening, everyone's round. So every Friday um, is, is like the set day that everyone comes together. So we'll get the like Friday, Friday evening, we'll get the big pots out. <laughs> And we'll like cook like about a couple of dishes. And I mean, when I mean big pots, I mean like the big, <laughs> the big restaurants. I know pots. which ones you mean. <laughs> My mouth's already watering. I'm coming round. So yeah, that's like Friday because we're cooking for like eleven kids and how many adults? Probably another like oh gosh, seven, eight, seven yeah. eight adults. And the boys are all like growing up now, teenage boys. So they eat more than like they triple what I eat. Yeah. So it's like you're having to cater for these growing kids. But and the boys like now, my nephews, they're all towering over me, but I've still got the authority, like they still know that <laughs> if I'm telling them off. And that's the other thing. They're not my children, but I still am the person that can discipline them and will discipline them and they'll listen. They won't be like, You're not my parent. If I tell them off, their mums aren't saying, Why are you telling my children off? They're just like if the kids then don't listen, they'll be like, no, listen to your aunt. Because that respect has been instilled in them from yeah. from when they were born. Yeah. It's just, this is how it is. Yeah. There's no yeah. other way. You wouldn't have it any other way, would you? No, no. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Because I've, I've kind of like, you know, I've bathed them, I've cleaned them, and, you know, 
to me, they are they are like my children. When when Anya got her GCSE results, <laughs> it's out at the time. Yeah, that was interesting. This, this is how this is how sometimes maybe my family is a bit overbearing. Like we were all on video calls. <laughs> yeah, I was sitting <laughs> on the sofa, and my dad had just come back from work, so I, w- I waited an extra hour for him to get back from work so I could open it, and then we had my auntie on one phone another auntie on another phone yeah all the so family the crowded around me the maternal family on, on video calls yeah us lot her paternal family on video calls just watching to know what all my siblings so we could, we could all we could all experience her getting her results together yeah and that's we do that with like all of them and even like anything big with me it's like the family are told about it yeah. straight away everyone gets told at the same time so we have a family group chat, huge one, with yeah. actually with both my mum's side and my dad's side, all in one group. Yeah, sometimes it can, <laughs> outside of mine, it can be overbearing. Yeah. But I can feel the love. Yeah. I can really, yeah. really feel the love, the respect um, from both of you sitting here talking. I can see how sort of your eyes light up when you talk about <laughs> your families and your relationships. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I just want to say thank you so much for educating us on your backgrounds, on your culture, and how important a family is, yeah. extended yeah. families, and also, Mum says, your journey on, you know, from yeah. going from not wearing hijab to wearing hijab, and how, you know, you did it for you, and no one else, yeah. and that's what absolutely matters. Would you like to leave us with any words of wisdom, or anything you want to tell us before we finish the podcast? So I would just, just like to say, obviously, connection, you know, if you, even if you don't have family, when you when you have close friends as well, they're your chosen family. And even when you fall out with people, don't don't let that fallout be the reason why you disconnect from people. Because you know, if you've got siblings, you fall out with them, but they're still your like having a good connection with people. It's just key because they're the people that lift you up when you need it. And then the people that you celebrate with when you when you're happy. So I think it's just just having connection with people, and it doesn't always have to be somebody that looks like you either. Just you know, choose good people in your life that are going to lift you up, and that will ce- celebrate with you in the good times and cry with you in the bad times. I love that. Thank <laughs> you so much, both of you, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.